that's gonna hold. Um, okay, well, thank you everybody for being here on this gloomy Friday afternoon. And thank you, Westmont, so much for the opportunity to be here and for organizing. And thanks to my fellow panelists uh, for setting me up and being so awesome to be in the conversation with. Um, okay, so I am Christina Dunbar Hester. I teach in media studies uh, at Rutgers, but my background is in science and technology studies. So that's um, where I'm oriented. I also want to say that my um, being on this panel is sort of an anomaly because I've been involved in ethnographic research on hackerspace and open source communities, uh, but looking at totally different phenomena in them than what I'm going to talk about today. So this is me kind of going out on a limb um, at Wazma's invitation, and I'm excited too, but I'm a little nervous about it too. Um, so what I'm talking about today is um, amateur technologists building uh, basically drone projects and related robotics projects here in the US. Um, and so in general, I work on the politics of technology and activist technical communities. Um, what I'm going to do today is two things. Uh, first, a little bit of situating um, what drones are and what they might do uh, within theory from STS, basically. And then second of all, I'm going to get into this empirical site about uh, hobbyist or amateur work uh, in the US context. And I think that that provides a perspective on and a critique of some of the traction that these devices are currently enjoying. Um, but I want to thank everybody also for the sort of wider ranging geographically and um, politically presentations and also to Chris for bringing up history because I'm not a historian but I often wind up uh, playing with them and having a uh, historical sensibility that I'm going to have to mostly skip today so I'm glad he brought some of that up. Um, okay, so a widespread discourse that we hear about technology is that technology itself isn't necessarily anything uh, in terms of being attached to values, but it's attached to use. Uh, in other words, there's an idea that technologies are merely tools, tools that can be used well or poorly, and for good or bad purposes. Um, so the idea that technologies are merely neutral tools. Um, this is a very common idea, you'll see it everywhere, and it is definitely deployed around drones, which I'll get into some today. Um, but most scholars in social studies of technology will approach this differently. Historian Melvin Kranzberg has famously noted that technology is neither good nor bad, but nor is it neutral. Uh, and going further, Langdon Winner has elaborated probably one of the most full critiques. Uh, he notes that these so-called tools are not merely put to whatever use the human agents choose to put them to. Uh, rather, technologies are powerful forces around which patterns form, and uses become structured in patterned ways. Uh, indeed, for Winner, certain technologies are almost invariably linked to certain patterns of use. Social relations and power dictate not only how technologies are used, but how they're even built in the first place. And thus, the patterns that will then shape their use are inscribed into technologies and artifacts themselves. Uh, so just keeping this in mind, I will move on then to the topic of amateur involvement producing drones. And I'll just situate this a little bit. Um, okay, so in 2009, Wired Magazine editor-in-chief Chris Anderson launched a new venture, a website entitled DIY Drones, which now boasts over 30,000 registered users. And this is a slide from... Um, that site, and it says a newbie's guide to uh, UAVs, and you can see that this technology is sort of highly aestheticized and highly abstracted, and it's a drone, right? Um, so Anderson described the mission of DIY drones as, quote, open sourcing the military industrial complex. So what we're looking at now is a distributed network of hobbyists endeavoring to build software and hardware components for these unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, and I also want to situate this within the growing emergence of what are called hacker spaces in the US. Uh, the US iteration owes a debt to European hacker spaces, but the raison d'etre for these spaces really can't be generalized beyond a couple of points. 
Um, one, technology and technical practice is a central organizing principle, and the notion of making or do-it-yourself DIY is salient. Um, second, many participants understand these activities as contributing to or forging a sense of community, but I would say that beyond that, it gets harder to generalize. Uh, the European hackerspace movement to which the US one owes a debt uh, has a more radical left political heritage and is associated with, for example, the squatter movements of the 1980s. Um, we could definitely interrogate them, but I will actually be leaving them out of the talk. The US hackerspace movement does have some strands of that more politicized, more left um, view about technology and agency, but it also has many hackerspaces that are populated by much more ordinary engineering folks. Um, and in the US, engineers are much more likely than other members of the citizens, citizenry to, for example, have an affinity for Ayn Rand. So the politics of engineers <laughs> are important here. Um, I also want to point out, and I assume everyone in this audience is familiar with this, but just for the sake of it, these social spaces don't necessarily have much in common either with what uh, the media has constructed hackers as being. Um, this is, you know, these are kind of often um, kind of nostalgic DIY spaces uh, that are about, um, you know, hobbyist electronics, um, woodworking, tool sharing, etc. It's um, the idea that technology can be opened up and hacked to work in novel ways over which the maker or hacker has mastery. So not so much necessarily in common with the figure of um, nefarious hackers on the internet or whatever. So more MacGyver, less anonymous. Um, and I also want to make a sociological point about who these amateurs are. I mentioned engineers. There's a long-standing association between people with technical and engineering day jobs who participate in technical hobbies on their time off. So think radio, ham radio, homebrew computing, etc. And the DIY drone folks are no exception to this. Many of them work in technical fields and are middle class or above. And there's also a lot of white masculinity in these spaces. And this is a slide from um, a Baltimore hacker space the first meeting of the Baltimore Drones Meetup in January of this year, and you can get a little bit of a sense of the technology and the, can read some things about the social identity of the people. Um, okay, so what are people doing with these drones? Uh, what I'm gonna be arguing today is that amateur drone making is accompanied by a rhetorical effort to decouple drones from their military applications. To a significant degree, the hobbyists claim to pursue a vision of drones as, quote, demilitarized and democratized, end quote. Um, to quote at length from Chris Anderson's presentation of these personal drones in Wired, he says, like the early personal computers, the main use at this point is experimentation, simple geeky fun. But as personal drones become more sophisticated and reliable, practical applications are emerging. The film industry is already full of remotely piloted copters serving as camera platforms with a longer reach than booms, as well as cheaper and safer operations than manned helicopters. Some farmers now use drones for crop management, creating aerial maps to optimize water and fertilizer distribution. And there are countless scientific uses for drones, from watching algae blooms in the ocean to low altitude measurement of the solar reflectivity of the Amazon rainforest. Others are using the craft for wildlife management, tracking endangered species and quietly mapping out nesting areas that are in need of protection, end quote. Sorry, it's long. Um, so you can see there's a lot of effort here to play up reasons for civilian interest in drones that will relate to, that will relate to play, having fun, to scientific research and to economic development. And I wanna point out this is a rhetorical move to establish drones as neutral. It just matters what use you put them to, right? Um, Anderson goes on to say that drones are distinguished both by their automatic piloting capacities and by the fact that they usually carry some sort of payload, but again, the payload could be any old thing. It could be weapons, it could be cameras, it could be heat sensors, whatever. Uh, he says that both the $140 million Global Hawk drone circling over Afghanistan and his children's $500, foot foam, $500 foam toy meet the criteria for being drones 
and they're largely distinguished by scale and use, but they're all drones. Um, okay, so as I said, the hackerspace and drone hobbyist communities are not monolithic. Uh, we also do see some <laughs> more radical activist um, interest in building drones for highly emancipatory purposes, perhaps. Um, some are promoting what artist and theorist Steve Mann has termed surveillance, or surveillance from below, aimed at increasing the capacity of citizens without state or other forms of power to increase the accountability of entities like police. And so here's a quote exemplifying this interpretation of drones. There's a clear, clear and urgent need for citizen-controlled aerial observation devices. Such devices would greatly extend the reach of citizen journalism, would make it easier to obtain high-resolution photos for more accurate and openly verifiable crowd estimates, and to better document and even help deter incidents of police brutality and much more. And so this is from a hackerspace project called Occupopter. So Occupy is in there too. Um, and I don't have this quote up, but I think it's kind of fantastic. Uh, both the emancipatory and the sort of inchoate goals of some of these drone enthusiasts, they have another quote on this site that says, step one, design and build a fleet of Occupopters. Step two is a line of question marks. And step three is freedom, <laughs> exclamation point. So um, there you have it, folks. Problem solved. Um, so we can see there's a wide range of interest in this amateur drone participation and an effort to construct the drones as demilitarized and democratizing. Um, we see the rhetorical construction of drones as neutral, merely depending on what they carry as pay payload and what uses they'll be put to. Um, but I'm here to suggest that there's much more going on here. Even if we take the amateur drone community's claims at face value, there is little evidence that demilitarization is one of their core concerns. Uh, some hackerspaces and related hobbyist communities, in fact, are courting state funding from defense agencies. Uh, in 2012, Tim O'Reilly's Maker Fair accepted a grant from a DARPA program devoted to revolutionizing the way defense systems and vehicles are designed. And uh, that was actually a, pro a project to put mentoring programs for STEM in high schools. Uh, controversy then rippled through hacker communities as a result. And uh, nonetheless, though, DARPA funding for hackerspaces is becoming an established fact. Um, and to take another Chris Anderson quote, he's very heavily present in my talk today. He says, the main difference between the two drones, a military one and a civilian one, is that the Global Hawk can fly at 60,000 feet for 32 hours, and our craft can fly at 400 feet for 30 minutes. What we lack in high altitude optics, we make up in proximity. We can easily read license plates from the air." End quote. Uh, so I want to ask, though, why is reading license plates from the air a priority for civilians? There could be reasons, but I'm, I'm not sure what they are. Uh, so Anderson has said elsewhere that the whole project is open sourcing the military industrial complex, as I said. And then he says, in two years, we have begun disrupting a multi-million dollar industry with the open source model. We can deliver 90% of the performance of military drones at 1% of the price. And again, the standard here is military drones and their performance. The goal is to make them widely diffused and much more inexpensive. But beyond that, it's not articulated. Um, I don't mean to suggest that there's not ambivalence amongst drone hobbyists or hackerspace participants about this militarized legacy and present. Uh, in a Philadelphia hackerspace, one member told me she was put off by conversations on their listserv about um, their technical conversations about one-winged flight, as in the movement of a maple seed fluttering to earth. Uh, she said of a member effusing on the listserv about these technical principles of one-winged flight, she said, Dave is a very, very sweet and very smart member who happens to work for Lockheed, I think, but in the military industrial complex for sure." end quote. So this points to two things. One, the overlap between these hobbyists and people employed by defense contractors, which I already noted. Um, and in fact, Lockheed has debuted a one-winged UAV called the Samara. Um, the other point raised by this informant informant is that 
she says, because of social ties and wanting to maintain a coherent and civil community within the space, there's a politeness incentive to depoliticize the conversation. Mm -hmm. So, end quote. Mm -hmm. It was easier for her to talk to me about this discomfort with uh, potential overlap between their hobbyist activities and military industrial complex activities than it was to raise it in the group for a whole host of reasons. Um, another way I think that these not only, um, so, so politeness is a goal, one way to sidestep the politics or applications of amateur drones is to keep the conversations purely technical, uh, which we can see a little bit of this in this video. It's quite long and I'm just going to show a little bit of it, but you can get a sense of what's in here and what's potentially not in here. Uh, my DIY UAV project, this is called. Wire and solder them all together, and possibly even write the software code needed to make it all work. All that has changed thanks to the efforts of a number of online communities that have designed the hardware, developed sources for it, and have written the necessary software code. That doesn't mean that it's plug and play just yet, but it's close. Three efforts that I'm aware of are the Paparazzi Project, Open Pilot, and Arju pilot. A number of individuals have developed their own autopilots as well. For my DIY UAV, I'm using the Arju pilot Mega 2.0 autopilot, also simply known as APM2. This was developed out of the efforts of the DIY drones community, which was started by Chris Anderson, the editor-in-chief of Wired magazine. The beginnings and following evolution of this overall project I think the internet has run out, and that's just fine. Um, okay. So what, what I want to point out there, if we'd watch more of the video, it would have been equally true, um, is that basically this is a you know technocratic and technical conversation only, and I think that some of the work that that's doing is um, it papers over the fact that the drones are the technology wrapper for a set of human political agendas, whatever those may be, right? You can at least bracket those out if you're only talking about your Arduino and your um, you know, remote control or whatever. Um, that was what we just did. Uh, and so I've got another example here from the DIY drone homepage, again, uh, evoking this move to subsume politics into the technical. Um, and so what's going on here this is the logo from the top of the page, which I've put into the slide, and then at the bottom, a user comments, given that the site is focused intently on non-military, non-commercial UAVs, would it be, not be worth considering a slightly less commercial military UAV to use as a logo or a mascot? Perhaps a kinder, gentler UAV, just saying. Uh, and then Anderson himself actually replies and says, this drawing was based on a NASA research drone, no weapons, end quote. Um, so I think this really exposes the potential non-neutrality and even aesthetics of drones, and yet our drone evangelist, Anderson, seeks to black box these politics and history and deflate this other user's concerns. Uh, of course, I don't mean to suggest that just putting a happy face on the drone would be sufficient to divorce it from military associations and origins, um, but Anderson's denial that there are deep linkages between these origins and aesthetics has to be read as a political move. Um, okay, so moving towards conclusions. While these UAVs may or may not have inherent politics, the amateurs involved in DIY drones have articulated undercutting military procurement economics as one goal, as I showed. Um, and this is a quote related to that. For me, the ultimate measure of our community is what we build together aerospace quality technology by volunteers. Um, so with this, I think arguably civilians are engaged in conducting military R&D as well as military public relations, all while sidestepping the potential politics of the artifacts they're tinkering with. Amateurs are instead focusing on the ostensible <coughs> superiority of the peer production practices along with the joy of tinkering. Uh, application is largely ignored or claimed to merely be just a question of choice, how you're gonna use it. Um, I wanna note here that the networked collaboration styles like open source and peer production are often associated with being anti-bureaucratic countercultural styles. 
Um, but Fred Turner has argued that the origins of these self-consciously self-organizing forms of collaboration can in fact be found in Cold War military university industry research. So another nod to the history here. Um, so I'm suggesting that while current amateur technologists recapitulate a form of practice that amounts to collaboration with the military university industrial complex, their focus on volunteer production or network collaboration provides rhetorical cover for these amateur technocrats to either leave unexamined potential consequences of their hobbies or even to bolster militarism under the guise of apolitical affective pleasure and technology. Uh, so I think that the claims that amateur enthusiasm for drones is apolitical is itself a politics and one we should be very suspicious of. Uh, we don't have to believe in the autonomy of technology to believe that certain technologies are strongly compatible with certain uses. Technologies always come with politics articulated to them, and the ones for drones seem distinctly related to warfare and surveillance. Amateur communities are largely not succeeding in rec reclaiming or re-governing drones, in part because their own origins and affinities are shot through with ambivalence about militarism. Arguably, the use of these military technologies for what amounts to high-tech toys for civilians may have some role in simulating and thus normalizing their use in remote war. That's all. Thank you.